Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the first of five sessions about fluidity. We'll look at the flow of life in this series. We'll feel it in our bodies. Notice how it affects our relationships with other humans and other life forms. And we'll consider how it moves through the natural world. We'll come to more deeply appreciate how the flow of life is really a single flow that manifests itself in body, society, and ecosphere. These videos will offer information and framing to help us explore the fluidity of life. What they won't offer is much in the way of meditation instruction. It's important, however, to combine the conceptual understanding with direct embodied experience in meditation. So the videos will offer some basic suggestions for how to meditate on these topics. But if you want more instruction, I encourage you to enroll in the online classes offered through College of Marin. Registration links are available on my website, mindfulbiology.org. I'd like to begin with a brief review of Mindful Biology and its aims. It has the name Mindful in its title, so of course it's related to mindfulness. And what we now call mindfulness is largely based on an ancient Buddhist scripture called the Satipatthana Sutta that you may be familiar with. The sutta says that when we practice mindfulness, we abide contemplating the body. And we contemplate it both internally and externally. As I understand it, there's wide agreement that contemplating the body internally means connecting intimately with its sensations. Feeling, for instance, the quality of airflow as it moves in and out of the nostrils. So contemplating the body internally is the statement that most captures what we think of as mindfulness, which is usually defined as something like non-judgmental awareness of phenomena, and in this case, phenomena within the body. So when we're non-verbally and very directly experiencing bodily life, we are practicing mindfulness in the most widely understood sense of the term. It appears there is less consensus around what it means to contemplate the body externally. The viewpoint that I favor, because it resonates with my own style of practice, is that contemplating the body externally means bringing a conceptual awareness to it. So we understand how the body is constituted. We understand its various parts. And by contemplating the body in this conceptual way, we are encouraged to disidentify from some of the transient aspects of the body that often cause us difficulty. For instance, we can soften our feelings around the aging of the body. Clearly, to contemplate the body conceptually can include contemplating it biologically. And therefore, it seems sensible to offer a practice called mindful biology, as I do. I began teaching a style of meditation that was both mindfully and biologically based back in 2010. It seemed obvious to me that mindfulness and biology could be combined to form a single practice. But I wasn't finding much that was done by others that actually brought the two together in that way. There were teachers who used biology in support of mindfulness instruction, and there were researchers who studied mindfulness with biological techniques. But I was unaware of anybody that brought the two together as equal partners and formed a meditation practice from them. Recently, I came across this book, Being Nature, A Down-to-Earth Guide to the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, by Wes or Scoop Nisker. Wes Nisker uses biology, and specifically evolutionary biology, to support mindfulness meditation. 
and in fact the four foundations are the practices laid down by the Satipatthana Sutta we just discussed. It's very gratifying to me to know that a respected meditation teacher like Wes Nisker thought it worthwhile enough to bring biology and mindfulness together to write an entire book about it. What surprised me was finding out that this text is a reissued version of an earlier book under a different title that Wes Nisker published in 1998. In other words, his earlier book scooped my practice of mindful biology by more than 10 years. I want to give him credit for that work and for this text, and I highly recommend this book to anyone interested in mindful biology. But let's move on now and begin to look at how mindfulness and biology can help us as we explore the quality of fluidity that is ubiquitous in our bodies, our relationships, and our environment. Within the Satipatthana Sutta, there are a number of suggestions for how the body can be contemplated internally and externally. One of those centers on the so-called four element system, earth, air, fire, and water, which is a pre-scientific way of categorizing qualities of phenomena in the world. So the earth element often refers to something that is solid, the water element often refers to something that flows, and so on. We find versions of the four elements in many ancient traditions, including Greek philosophy, the yoga and Hindu traditions, and Chinese medicine. I introduced the four elements in mindful biology in a series entitled Entirety, and the first talk of that series goes into more detail about the four element system. In this series, which is about fluidity, we'll be primarily looking at the so-called water element. Now from a modern scientific perspective, we know that water isn't actually a fundamental element. It's a molecule made up of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. And we understand, as the ancients must have, that water can be found in various forms. Thus it can be found in a solid form we call ice. Well, for the purpose of a talk about fluidity, we aren't so interested in the ice form of water. We're much more interested in its liquid form. Now, when water molecules are in the solid form that we call ice, they are relatively constrained in position. They line up in a kind of lattice-like arrangement. They jiggle around in that lattice, but they don't move out of their position. This changes as the ice is heated and the movements gradually become more and more active until the lattice structure breaks down and things begin to flow. And it's at that point when things start flowing that we can really tap into this quality of fluidity. Flow, of course, is something we see all around us, particularly as water moves across the face of the earth. So it evaporates from oceans, accumulates in clouds, falls as rain, gathers into streams, moves down those streams, including over rapids and waterfalls, moves through lakes at times, and eventually returns to the ocean. And of course, it's also absorbed by plants and evaporation continues and the cycle goes around and around and around. All that flow. Well, water also flows through our body we all know that there's a lot of water in the body. The estimates for any particular body usually are between 55 and 60 percent, depending on the amount of body fat. One way we can see the flow of water in the body is simply by noticing that we drink liquids, which of course uh, are predominantly water, even if they're milk or juice or what have you. And the liquid enters the bloodstream, and at some point the excess liquid is released from the body through the process we call urination. So our bodies are very much a part of this ongoing flow of water in the biosphere, and I think we're all aware of that. Moving to the flow within the body in more biological terms, you know, more specific terms, we can look at the beating heart, this very important organ that keeps the water of the body, the water of the blood, moving. It moves through arteries and veins and capillaries. And here we're watching blood flow 
It's got the large red blood cells that carry oxygen, and it's suspended in a watery plasma that the heart is pumping and that keeps everything moving. So there's this very biological, very liquid, very fluid flow going on all the time in each of us. There are many other examples of flow within the body and between people. One of the most touching is the flow of milk from mother to infant, as we see here. So the liquid milk produced by the mammary gland is secreted as the infant sucks at the nipple, and then the infant swallows the milk, which enters the infant body and proceeds through it in the way we just saw. And that's a very material phenomenon of the flow of water and the substances that comprise milk. But there's another more subtle kind of flow at play here, and that's the flow of connection, interpersonal resonance, emotion, and we say love. As the mother looks at the infant and the infant gazes back, this very strong flowing sense of connectivity is obvious even to onlookers, and of course, much more so to the mother and child themselves. And thus we can think of the heart in a more metaphorical sense, the heart of the valentine, the heart of love. All of these aspects of human experience are flowing. They all have fluidity, and so they all can be topics for us to investigate in this series. In the online class, I would pause at this point and guide a meditation directing people to the various experiences of flow that they can discover in this very moment. Of course, you can devise such a meditation quite easily on your own, and I encourage you to do so. Just a few minutes spending some time noticing how there are flowing and liquid qualities in your body, such as the saliva and the swallowing aspect in the mouth, and also how there is flow in your experience of life itself, the changing of emotions, the flow of thoughts and memories through your mind. But we'll move on here in this video and return to the idea of looking at the body in a way that allows us to categorize different qualities of experience. So the use of the four element system is one classification system, but there are many others. An example is the kosha system. Koshas are like layers of human experience. Often five of them are described, but in some traditions, as I understand it, including some strains of Tibetan Buddhism, four koshas are described. And I am using a system that is related to that four kosha program. If you want a little more information about how I'm working with these, I refer you to the sensitivity series, and in particular, the first talk of that series. We don't need that background information, however, to work with koshas in a mindful and biological way. I'll be presenting them as consisting of four different layers or bodies of experience that we'll call the objective body, the mammalian body, the cellular body, and the universal body. And in the remainder of this talk, I'll introduce these briefly. And then for the rest of the series, we'll go into them in a more in-depth fashion. So the objective body is the body of concept. So when we're conceptually considering how the body is structured, using, for instance, biological information, we're looking at the body as if it's a sort of object that we can inspect and describe. So that described body is the objective one. It's the body of concept, the body of thought, the body of science. And so one concept that we have a lot of familiarity with through a biological research is this idea that blood consists of liquid plasma that has within it a great many cells suspended, including uh, these red blood cells we're looking at now that carry oxygen. Okay, so that's a conceptual understanding of blood in the body. It's an objective aspect of biological life that's been studied and that we know at least something about. These understandings, all these conceptual ideas about the body are very valuable. They're valuable for medical reasons, but they're also valuable for self-knowledge. 
Well, I think they have greater value if we can move beyond the experience of them as ideas and concepts and begin to feel some of these biological entities in our direct experience. And this brings us to what I call the cellular body. When we feel very intimately and deeply into our bodily experience, in some sense we are connecting with the living cells that comprise it, all 30 or 40 trillion of them. Now, it would be hard to prove that we are able to feel individual cells, but we definitely have the capacity to feel a kind of granular, vibrating, tingling sensation throughout the body that is very subtle, but becomes ever more pronounced as we learn to center our awareness on it. In some traditions, this is called energy. Thus, we have the idea of chi and prana in Chinese medicine and the yoga Hindu traditions respectively. So there's this feeling of a flowing, vibrating, somewhat granular sensation that spreads throughout the body. And this is a direct experience that we can learn to become more and more aware of. Well, what if we move to the type of flow and fluidity that we see between mother and baby? Well, here we're looking at the mammary gland providing nurturance to the little baby. And of course, the word mammary is the root of the word mammal. So there's a very important sense in which to be a mammal is to be an organism that connects in this profound way with others. Now, no bond is quite as intimate and powerful as the bond between mother and baby. But every bond between any two humans has a flowing, resonant, emotional quality to it. In other words, it has a kind of mammalian flavor. Our mammalian bodies are so built around the idea of connecting with others that there's a kind of optimism or hopefulness built into our organism. It comes into the world expecting connection with other beings. The baby, of course, has a very powerful connection with the mother that forms as soon as she enters its field of awareness. And its body, its biology, is tuned to expect that mother to appear and to bond when she does. But we have a similar kind of hopefulness in every interaction. Now, if we've been hurt a lot in life, we may not feel consciously very hopeful. But even the experience of loneliness and betrayal and so on are rooted in the idea that our mammalian bodies expect connection, and it's the frustration of that expectation that leads to much of our pain. So one advantage of connecting with mammalian qualities in human life is to connect with our deep and innate hopefulness. Me merely saying these words won't do much to evoke that hopefulness, but we can learn to practice in order to do so. And when we get to the third talk of this series, I'll try to demonstrate how. The final body is the universal body, as I call it. And this highlights our connection with and dependence on a much larger field of biological and physical reality. So just as our individual body grows because of the nurturance and support of our mother's body and after birth, her mammary glands and her emotional support and so on. Well, we are also similarly born of and dependent upon the entire cosmos. The most direct way to see that is to look at our relationship to the biosphere. After all, our species evolved out of the biosphere. Our bodies grow within it, dependent upon the nourishment it provides, and we remain dependent upon it throughout our lives. And when we die, we return to the biosphere as a diffusion of the constituents of our body uh, back into the soil and atmosphere so they can be reused as life continues to evolve. Well, the Earth, of course, grew out of a much larger cosmos, which is, in a certain sense, the original body. In our direct experience in meditation, we can begin to feel how our individual body is part of, born from, and deeply and inseparably interwoven with the larger cosmos. And that's how we'll end this series in the fifth talk. So here we are with this human body facing the world. And as we face the world, experiences come toward us, we respond, and they recede into what we call the past. 
As this happens, our bodily interior also responds. So there's a response that's conscious, that we think about and talk about, and then there's a much larger and more diffuse response as different circumstances have an impact on our physiology. So as we watch the waves of life approach us, we learn over time how to respond to the various ups and downs in our experience. There are easy times and hard times and so on. And there is all the flowing going on within the body itself, particularly the flow of blood and other liquids, but there are many other aspects of flowing that we will explore, including the flow of emotion. So life has this ongoing fluid or flowing quality as the waves of experience approach and then recede behind us. As we grow, we improve our ability to meet these waves with support of other beings and the biosphere. This is one of the important aspects of human life, is just learning to meet experience and to continue to grow and thrive. Of course, sometimes the experience takes on a much more potent and forceful aspect. So we have these huge crashing waves of serious losses and setbacks and injuries and so on. Some of them we can take in stride. We have built up enough capacity to deal with a little bit of intensity in our experience, or maybe a lot of it. But sometimes the waves of experience become so strong and so powerful and so beyond our prior experience that we feel overwhelmed. And this is when we begin to talk about experiences that qualify as trauma. They are experiences that seem overwhelming, beyond our capacity to cope, at least in the short run. What happens when we're traumatized, among other things, is a kind of a solidifying of our ordinary fluid aspect into a kind of habitual and hardened response. So an example would be the soldier returning from a war zone who hears a loud noise and goes immediately into a attack and defense mode without much thought and very stereotypically. Or if we've suffered a lot of early life trauma that has made us feel socially insecure, then every social situation may evoke in us a sense of threat and wariness which we call social anxiety. So trauma has a lot to do with losing the range of responses that are ordinarily available and locking down on a few habitual ones that feel protective. This rigidity that develops is observable in many layers of experience. It's observable in the mental cognitive realm as we have repetitive thoughts going through our minds, often very negative, seldom very productive. The solidity can settle into the emotional regions of the brain, the so-called limbic system, in the form of chronic anxiety, panic reactions, and so on. We can have certain very habitual emotional responses that get trotted out in a variety of experiences, even when we might, if we were less traumatized, choose otherwise. So, for instance, a response of extreme anger to perceived slights can sometimes be useful, but is often not. And yet, if we've been traumatized, we might have a habit of responding very angrily anytime we feel a little bit disrespected or a little bit ignored. Of course, there are many other examples. I'm just giving a few to indicate the flavor of how rigidity is experienced. We can certainly feel rigidity in the muscles of our body. They feel tense. They have spasm and soreness. This is a chronic and very common experience, traumatized. There are effects on the digestive system. So we might suffer indigestion or constipation or diarrhea or more habitual rigid patterns such as irritable bowel syndrome. Very common patterns that emerge after trauma. There can be patterns observed even at the cellular level, a change in how immune cells react and what messenger molecules they secrete. There can be increase in inflammation throughout the body, for instance. So there's this aspect of trauma occurring at all different layers of experience. Now, as humans living in a very cerebrally oriented culture that values education and intellect, 
and that tends to place a lot of emphasis on thinking, it's very natural for us to try to resolve our trauma rigidity through thought. And many of us work very hard to figure out why we feel so uncomfortable and what we can do about it. This can certainly be helpful at times. It certainly can help to discuss our past trauma and how it affected us with a caring person who listens to us non-judgmentally and offers uh, gentle occasional guidance. But very often in our own daily lives, as we ruminate about what's going on, we get caught in cycles that feel rather harsh and repetitive. So the mind goes around and around trying to figure out why things aren't going the way it wants, what it can do about it, and nothing substantive really changes or softens the rigidity. And yet the cycle continues in a kind of vicious, repetitive way. Well, fortunately, there are other ways to begin to work at dissolving some of the trauma rigidity. And I'm going to offer some suggestions in this series. At the end of this talk, I'll discuss trauma in a little broader sense, because what's offered here in the series will not be sufficient to resolve any major amount of trauma memory or trauma symptomatology, but it can be a helpful adjunct. The idea is that if we can expand our awareness out of thinking, you know, beyond thinking, and connect with the hopefulness of the mammalian experience, the vibrancy of cellularity, and the vast power of being connected with and at one with the universe. If we can begin to experience, to tune in, as it were, to a broader range of what the body offers, we can begin to dissolve some of our trauma rigidity. And it can gradually melt away, maybe not entirely, but enough so that we can begin to feel renewed and meet life with more zest. At this point in the online class, I would offer a meditation taking our attention from the realm of thought to the realm of bodily sensation in, for instance, the torso and the shoulders and the neck into a more diffuse sense of vibrancy, perhaps feeling into the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, feeling the tingling and warmth that is sometimes detectable there, and then remembering in a kind of non-conceptual way how we're immersed in the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the cosmos. As this video comes to a close, I'd like to add a couple of comments. We've touched on the subject of trauma. This is a large and important subject with many implications for individual, societal, and planetary well-being. The approaches offered in this and the subsequent fluidity videos can be helpful as we make progress in softening the rigidity that often follows trauma. But if we are suffering from any significant trauma symptomatology, the videos will not be sufficient and professional help is required. There are many well-trained trauma-informed clinicians available in most communities and also online. I encourage you to seek assistance if you are struggling with trauma memories or post-traumatic symptoms.